Timothy Treadwell. And as soon as I mention that name, you think we're in for a long one. Tim was a very controversial man, but he did dedicate his life to what he felt was the most just thing he could do. And that just thing was protecting grizzly bears. But when most of you think of protecting a bear, or any animal for that matter, you probably imagine yourself donating some money to some sort of organization or charity, or even doing like a beach cleanup, or turning off the lights on the beach so the turtles don't go away from the ocean. But Tim, that wasn't enough. Tim, well, he took it to the extreme. He was known as the man who lived with bears. Tim was born on April 29th, 1957 in Long Island, New York. He had a relatively pretty normal childhood. He had loving parents. He even got a scholarship as a swimmer. And from a very young age, he had a love for animals, even having a pet squirrel named Willie that lived in the house with him and his family. And he kind of had this strange obsession with teddy bears. As Tim got older and he went to college on his swimming scholarship, he actually ended up hurting his back and was not able to swim anymore. And this is where things kind of went downhill for Tim. He started getting into drugs and alcohol, as a lot of young people do when they're not sure what they want to do in their life and, you know, start experimenting a little bit. And Tim decided he wanted to change his life up a bit, mix it up. So he moved to California at around the age of 20. Now, at this point in life, Tim wanted to be a star. He wanted to be in movies. He wanted to be in television, whatever he could to get that star power. And originally his name, his last name was Tim Dexter. That's his family name, but he changed it to Treadwell because he felt like it suited his lifestyle a little bit more. And while like most people who moved to California looking for stardom, Tim had a bit of a rough time getting into any gigs. He did make it on a couple shows like Love Connection and even tried out for a part in the show Cheers, but eventually lost out to Woody Harrelson. So he almost kind of made it, but after not getting that gig, he kind of fell back into drugs pretty hard. He would tell people he was from Australia, even speaking in an odd accent that he claimed was Australian. He researched the name of a town in Australia so that when people would ask him, he'd actually be able to give them information to try to convince them that he actually was from there. And he also claimed he was an orphan. So things weren't exactly going smoothly for him. He felt like he needed to lie and to be somebody who he wasn't. Now, there is a documentary called Grizzly Man that goes into a deep dive of Tim's life. Hey everybody, Editing Dean here. Um, one of the things I didn't realize until after I did all the recording was that the guy who actually did this film, like the filmographer, he's actually... Hey, dumbass. Look over here. Yeah, over here. You would think if you spent so much time trying to become a YouTuber that you would put a little bit more research into your work. The man's name is Warner Herzog, and you know him from this. I would like to see the baby. Now if you could finish this freaking video, maybe you could get to 100,000 subscribers. You've had this thing recorded for a damn week already. Now quit procrastinating and get to work, for God's sakes. Well... including interviewing his friends and family. And during one of these interviews, one of Tim's friends from California spoke about him and gave some of this insight. And there's just something odd about a lot of these people that are interviewed, like this situation right here. That he didn't tell you the truth about his accent or his origins. And that never bothered me. Timmy always amused me. And there's an old saying on the farm, if it doesn't scare the cows, who cares? Well, I don't think Timmy ever scared the cows. So who cares? I don't know about you. I don't think that guy has ever stood foot on a farm. I could be wrong, but I mean, it sounds like he's doing the exact same thing that Tim was doing, just making up a life. Like who, who has ever said that? If you have said that or heard that saying before, please drop it in the comments below. Let me know. Now, at this point in time, Tim was very troubled and actually ended up overdosing on heroin. And I'm sure you can imagine that that would have been like a hard reset. Like, I need something to change. I need something different. And one of Tim's friends told him he needed to go up to Alaska and go see some of the bears that were up there because they were incredible. And so Tim did. And that was the beginning of 
well, what would be Tim's legacy? And in 1990, that's when Tim took the first steps to be called the Grizzly Man. Now, Tim started to go to Alaska every summer. He would fly to the Katmai coast and go to an area in Halo Bay that he called the Grizzly Sanctuary. It was a big, open, grassy area full of what is referred to as bear grass. And then every summer, he would move to a thicker area of the bush called Kathlia Bay. And this area he called the Grizzly Maze. And it was called that because there were a bunch of trails going through the thick underbrush that the Grizzlies would take. Now, for the first few years that Tim was out there, he only wrote down in journals and didn't have any actual recording equipment so these earlier we have no idea really what was going on except for the fact that he would spend his entire summer out there with the bears this is where he learned his ways of communicating with the bears showing them that he was not somebody to be messed with so the bears wouldn't mess with him he learned their body language he learned their routines he started to name them and become very close with many of them and it wasn't just the bears that tim became close with there were a couple families of fox that lived in the area and these fox basically became like his pets they were like domesticated almost they would follow him around they would stay at his campsite hey who's stealing that hat ghost i want that hat Ghost, that hat is a very important hat. I can't believe this. Ghost, where's that f hat? If it's in the den, I'm gonna f explode. Oh, man. It's a freaking den. He named them, he loved them. They would bring their pups to him. Hi, Spirit. Hi, Spirit. Hello, baby. There is no doubt in my mind and there shouldn't be doubt in anyone's mind that tim absolutely loved all of these animals at this point he had found his purpose and not only did he find his purpose he stopped drinking he stopped doing drugs this was his life and no matter what he was going to be dedicating to protecting these bears because that's how tim saw himself he called himself a warrior he was the protector of the bears he was doing what no one else would do and only he could do it in his eyes i came here i studied them protected them and I promise you, I promise, the grizzly people, I will be back. Now, after a few years of doing this, he would go on tours of schools, teaching kids about bears, and he would do it for free. He did truly want to show his passions. And honestly, Tim could have been one of, I don't know how you would say it, one of the greats. Like, he could have been a great name for conservation, but he took things too far by the early 2000s he had become a bit of a celebrity he was a bit controversial sure but people weren't actually seeing what he was doing because he wasn't recording anything so there was a bit of a gray area with him all they saw was a man who loved bears who would go out and did things that you know the average person wouldn't do i mean he even got a spot on the david letterman show now when you're with these grizzly bears you're surrounded by them they're very close to you is that how you live with them yes i always give them respect and lots of room because you know uh, a grizzly's the boss out there you, but you interact with them um it's important that every bear knows who i am and that i fit on their hierarchy if i'm to survive is it going to happen that, that one day we read a, a news article about you being eaten by one of these bears um no you know and and, it... and that kids is what we call foresight and throughout the years tim had more and more critics but honestly besides being with the bear as much as he was what was tim doing that was so controversial i mean you can go out in the woods and camp out there for months at a time and as long as you leave no trace i mean what are you actually harming well tim started recording tim started getting video of everything he was doing to show the people i mean this was the early 2000s now and it was a lot easier to get camera equipment out there you didn't have to lug around giant things on your shoulder and have an actual crew out there you could bring a little camcorder now yes i'm old enough to remember having to put a tape in a camcorder well stuff started coming out and there are videos plenty of them of tim sitting down and bears walking right up to him cubs walking up to him and he sticks his finger out like this bear will sniff him and he'll touch the bear i don't know about you but to me that is an automatic red flag i don't care who you claim to be there are boundaries one animal it might be okay to do that another not so much now i catch snakes i will touch animals i will catch animals but this is a nuanced situation 
Touching nature isn't necessarily a taboo thing to me, but it depends on what kind of nature it is. A snake does not rely on family units to get by. For the most part, they are solitary, and picking up a snake is not going to threaten its relationship with other snakes. But then there are certain animals that you don't touch for a specific reason, especially mammals. You're not supposed to walk up to a bison in Yellowstone National Park because they are dangerous animals. And although they will leave you alone most of the time, they can kill you. If you touch a calf, there's a good chance that the mother won't accept it anymore. If you touch a bear cub, there's a chance that the mother won't accept it anymore or that the mother will come after you because it's trying to protect its cub. You are putting unnecessary risk on all fronts but tim didn't see it this way tim was around the bear so much he started to believe he was a bear or at least wanted to be a bear he felt he had a special connection with these animals that no one else had so the rules that you're supposed to follow when out in nature they go out the window when it comes to tim there was a few month period where it hadn't rained and the bears this time of year should be feeding on as much salmon as possible so they can fatten up for the winter and hibernate but the salmon were stuck in the river and couldn't make it up the small stream where they normally would breed. And it got to the point where the bears started to turn on each other and a mother ate her cub. Oh, that's not up the little tuck, that's it. There's nothing else left. They've eaten everything. And this had a huge impact on Tim. He was extremely sad because he knew the cub. He loved that animal. I mean, he loved all the animals. He would repeat it over and over and over and over and over and over again. So what did Tim do to try to solve this problem? So Tim changed the river. What I have done is have a look. I have constructed a runway for them, a navigational trail. He moved rocks out of the way to create a path so that more water would flow down a certain area and the salmon were able to swim up the stream. And that is known as a no-no. You ever watched a video of a sea turtle hatching and going down the beach and a crab or a seagull or something comes up and eats it? And you wonder, why is the filmmaker just recording it and leaving it alone? Why isn't the filmmaker saving that turtle? Because that is what is called the natural way. That is the natural order of things. Things need to eat. That crab needs to eat just as much as the turtle does. Who are we to say that the crab isn't important? And in areas like this, sometimes the bear population needs to be naturally cold because if there are too many bears and they survive every single year, every single cub, well, eventually there's going to be overpopulation and then none of the bears are going to survive because they're all going to starve. Is it pretty? No. It's not pretty, but there are ebbs and flows to nature. And Tim decided that that wasn't good enough and that he needed to do something about it. Now, not everything Tim did was harmful. There was a situation where Tim one night had heard a bunch of wolves howling and the next morning he gets up and finds that one of the baby foxes that he loved had been eaten partially by wolves. You could tell this was a very sad negative event for him. I love you and I don't understand it's a painful world he loved these foxes and he was upset that this had happened tim didn't like the cruelty of the world and seemed to forget that that is the way nature is and that the bears do the exact same thing wolves needed to eat just as much as the fox did now all this time in the wilderness will have an effect on anyone and tim was no exception Militant isn't the right word, but Tim started to feel like the world was against him. He was the protector of the bears, and nobody could get in the way. No one could even visit to look at the bears. It was only Tim that was allowed to do that. He started to feel like the world was against him. And when I say the world was against him, he viewed himself as a bear at this point. At least that's what he told the cameras. So if the world was against him, the world was also against the bears. On one occasion, a group of tourists ended up coming to his little swath of paradise. And Tim got super close to them behind some bushes and recorded them and their interaction with the bear. Now, I'm not saying Tim was wrong that these people weren't being D-bags to this bear. Because they definitely were. They were throwing rocks at it. But Tim, this enraged him. Remember, Tim was a minor celebrity at this point. People knew where he was. People knew what he was doing. And people he swore were coming out to find him. 
and none of them had good intentions in his mind. One point, he recorded himself out in the open so that these people could definitely see him, kind of like as an act of defiance. And eventually these people did end up leaving, but not without leaving a sign that they knew he was there. They wrote on a log. And they said, see you next summer, Tim. Well, Tim took this as a threat. They also stacked rocks like these modern day heathen hippies. You know the ones, ones that everyone are crying about. And they also drew a smiley face on a rock near one of his food storages. And even though there was nothing really truly threatening about what they did, he took it as a threat. He kept on saying how creepy it was. And at this point, you can really start to see the cracks in his mental health starting to form. He also started calling out the government, because he claimed that the government only flew over a couple times a year. They weren't really paying attention to what the bears were doing. He swore up and down that they were letting poachers in and all sorts of bad stuff to happen. But in reality, it was probably a good thing that they didn't come for Tim, because he was breaking all sorts of rules. Like, you're not supposed to get within 100 yards of a bear, and he routinely broke that rule. You're also not supposed to have a permanent camp in a lot of these areas. You're only supposed to be able to camp in a spot for a week at a time, and then move at least a mile away from where you just camped. But Tim just flat out ignored this, because if he followed that rule, he wouldn't be able to be anywhere near as close as he wanted to to the bears in the areas he wanted to be in. So if the government really did come in and start doing everything that Tim wanted them to do, he would have been kicked out. So no matter what, it was a lose-lose situation for everybody involved. I don't think they could really do anything right in Tim's eyes. He saw himself as the warrior, the protector of the bears, and anyone else was just trying to hurt him. Now, although Tim was fully dedicated to the Grizzlies, it didn't stop him from wanting to make his way with the ladies. I don't mention the women for no reason, because Tim wasn't the only one who died that day. Over the course of a few years, Tim had brought a few women with him. There really isn't an actual known number. Most of them remained anonymous. And in the documentary, there are a few women who claimed that they weren't ever in a relationship, that it was completely platonic, but kind of a weird situation, like they lived together for a while and just... You know, it is what it is. And the day that Tim was attacked, his girlfriend, Amy Huguenard, was with him. Now, she had spent parts of the last three summers with him. She was only showed a handful of times in his videos, tried to stay kind of out of the spotlight. And it was said that she was actually very afraid of bears and that there were plenty of times where she didn't want to be out there. Why she kept on going, who knows at this point. He also had a girlfriend, Jewel Palavac, who was a close friend with Tim and who had known him for about 20 years. They worked together at a restaurant before Tim even did anything with bears. And eventually they actually started an organization together called Grizzly People. And it was devoted to protecting and preserving the bear's natural habitat. She also helped co-write one of his books, Among Grizzlies. So now we've got some context. And this is the part where Larry comes out and sings a silly song. Tim had a troubled youth and eventually found his purpose. But all of this culminates into what most people actually know the Grizzly Man for. In all seriousness though, um, this part gets kind of rough. Now the summer of 2023, ugh. Now the summer of 2003 kinda went on like any other summer. Tim and his girlfriend Amy had spent the summer there without a hitch, recording a bunch of video and actually almost making it out of there. They had returned to Kodiak and got into an argument with the airlines because the ticket prices had gone up. So instead of spending the extra money on the tickets, they decided to go back. Now they were only going to be there an additional week, but in terms of bears, that makes a huge difference. Now throughout September, the bears are eating as much salmon as possible. They're eating anything in their path because they are fattening up. And when there is a constant run of salmon, they don't really notice the bigger things that, you know, like people, because they have all the food they need right in front of them and it's easy for them. So they usually don't waste their energy. But over the course of a couple weeks, the salmon start to run out and die off and the bears know, okay, well, it's about to get cold. So we're going to go into hibernation. And that's exactly what pretty much all of the bears that Tim actually knew had done. Now this is where things start to get kind of dangerous because bears from the interior that don't have the same food sources will make their way to places where they will try to find more food. And so Tim started seeing bears that he wasn't very familiar with. The weather started getting worse. There were high winds and a bear showed up that was starting to worry both Tim and Amy. 
he started seeing older bears that were a bit skinnier that were scaring off other bears from the area because they were more desperate to find food. Also ended up recording a bear that was diving down to the bottom of the river to pick up dead salmon off the bottom. And it doesn't seem like much, but this behavior is an act of desperation. Desperate bear will do some terrible things. On October 5th, Tim used a satellite phone to call one of his friends in California and let him know they hadn't had any problems. And on October 6th, Billy Fulton, who was a Kodiak air taxi pilot, flew into the bay to go pick them up as he had done many times before. He knew where their camp was, and when he landed, right next to the grizzly maze, he was kind of surprised that nobody was there. But he didn't think much of it at this point, and he gets out of his plane, he parks it, starts walking up to the path where he knew that their camp was, and then he just got a weird feeling. He's calling out for them, no one's answering. He's starting to get nervous. So he turned around and started walking back towards his plane. And as he's going through the alders, he sees a bear. In that instant, he felt that something was terribly wrong and he booked it for his plane. He gets in the plane and he starts flying around and making some low passes. And that's when he saw what was left of Tim. The bear was near his remains. All he could make out was a head in a rib cage that was exposed. And the bear was right over him eating him. Willie made a few low passes and tried to scare off the bear, but every single time he passed by, the bear would get more aggressive and start eating him even faster. Eventually, Willie realized there wasn't much he could do at that moment, so he called the park service. They got out there as soon as they could. He knew what the situation was. They started walking up the path that they had come down where he knew Tim's body was, and out of nowhere, one of them yelled, BEAR! And they all started firing upon this bear. And instantly he knew it was the same bear that he had just saw eating what was left of Tim. Now at this point, they took the stomach contents from the bear and put them into big bags and carried them off. They got what was left of Tim as well. And they went up to his camp and got his belongings, including his camera. Now the camera is another situation that some of you have probably heard. Now all that is known is that the camera was recording, but the lens cap was on the camera. So you can hear what happened, but you can't see anything. So it's thought that we're setting up for a shoot when the bear attacked. And that is all we know about the final few moments of Tim and Amy's life. Very sad situation, but completely and totally and utterly preventable. Well, if you might not have noticed, I am in different attire right now. Um, I had some stuff come up, so I had to stop recording. There's a wide range of emotions from this situation. There are many people who feel empathy and sympathy and can understand why Tim did what he did. And at the same time, there are people who are saddened by the situation and there are people who are angry at the situation. And emotions ran high. Those bears are big and ferocious and they come equipped to kill you and eat you. Redwell was asking for got what he was asking for, he got what he deserved, in my opinion. Bears probably thought there was something wrong with him, like he was mentally retarded or something. Tim knew the dangers of this situation. He knew what could happen. It just hadn't happened to him, so he, he took unnecessary risks. And not only did he take unnecessary risks, he took them along with somebody else who didn't know what they were doing as much as he did. And at the end of the day, even though he knew that much, it still ended up getting him killed. In the documentary, it shows that his ex-girlfriend Jewel, which I had talked about earlier, was given the watch worn by Tim the day he died. And... That whole situation kind of felt kind of weird because they painted Jewel in the light of and literally even called her his widow when they weren't together when he died. He was literally with another woman. So, I mean. Do you sometimes feel like his widow? Ha! <laughs> Do I feel like his widow? Um, yeah, you know, in some ways I do. Also, Tim's parents still kept his stuffed animal bears. And I can kind of understand this one a bit, it just, to me, if I was in a situation where my son had literally been eaten by a bear in a very brutal way, and there's audio recording of that situation, I wouldn't want anything to do with bears anymore. I'm very mixed on my emotions of the situation. In the end, I feel like he 
didn't do any good for the Bears. I feel like at the end of the day, he could have done a lot more by not being as radical as he was. Did he spread knowledge about Bears? Absolutely, and during his time alive, I definitely believe that he changed some people's opinions on them. But once they killed him, that kind of switched in my mind. But once they killed him, I think that probably switched some people's opinions on them. I could be wrong. And hopefully he did change a lot of people's minds on Grizzlies. But besides founding, but besides founding the organization Grizzly People, I honestly wasn't really able to find anything else he did. At the end of the day, Tim was a dedicated man and he died doing what he loved. And that's more than a lot of us can say. Whew. Well, this has been an awesome video. At least this has been an awesome video to work on. Every single time I come out with one of these, I put more and more time into it and I feel like there's a new chapter opening up and a new kind of passion that I'm developing and I have some really awesome ideas moving forward. Um, definitely more documentary style videos and I have a few of those in the works. I hope you all enjoyed this. I hope this is the type of video you guys want to see and if you're new to the channel and you watched all the way through the end, leave a like and a comment down below and let me know what you thought. And if you've been here for a while, you have no idea how much I appreciate appreciate you. Ocho Verde Wildlife, I see your comments. You've been there basically since day one. I am so close to 100,000 and, and by the time this video is up, I will probably be only a couple thousand away from there. I can't thank you guys enough for that. I'm just going to strive to make better and better content and get you guys what you want to see. Once again, thank you all for watching and stay wild.